Welcome back to Restaurant Topia. We got a great episode for you here today with a special guest, Bruce Nelson. His book, Restaurant Management, The Myth, The Magic, The Math, really good read. Want to take a second to thank our sponsor, Hillcrest Food Service. If you're looking for a distributor, check out Hillcrest Food Service. We love and support local independent restaurants. 95% of our products are named brands. We can help you with business improvement, menu reviews, social media support. You can find us at hillcrestfoods.com. Imagine a perfect world where you can build a restaurant, open the doors, and make loads of money. Unfortunately, those days are over. It takes great leadership, hard work, and long hours to operate a successful restaurant. Together, we can make it happen. This is Restaurantopia. All right, welcome back to Restaurantopia. We got an amazing episode with our first author, great restaurant tour, and I've been following him on social media. He just put out a great book, uh, Miss Magic and Math. I just finished it. Uh, maybe if I put it in front of my face, the audience will like that better. But this is a cool book. We got Dave Ross, uh, my co-host, and Anthony Hamilton. But uh, Bruce, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for joining us. And uh, I really appreciate it. I read your book when I was on vacation, thought it was very good. I love the backstory, your experience, your, your family's experience, then your experience in starting your own restaurants, uh, and then just getting into what you would have done differently. Thank you for putting out a great resource for restaurateurs. Oh, you're welcome. I wish I could have joined you vicariously in Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> we all at least do. my book we got to enjoy do. the the warm weather well no, from yeah. what i from what i saw in some footage like brian worked on his video editing quite a bit and apparently read a book so he, well, accomplished, he accomplished a lot computers, you really flip pages right no i look like he had a physical copy no no i yeah, that, that doesn't that doesn't mean <laughs> like, like see see the see the the book darts are in there oh no book darts <laughs> wow got, okay, okay. Some, i i i stand corrected i apologize i don't mess around <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, it's a pr it's a pretty quick read, and it was done by design because you know restaurant tours aren't going to go through three hundred pages to figure out an answer. Oh, you're, you're absolutely that, correct. Yeah, that's very astute of you. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't need the Rosetta Stone to figure out how to operate a, a restaurant, and I I love some of your tips in here. But Bruce, give the audience a little bit about your background. I know you went into it in detail in the in the book. Sure, sure. I uh, <clears throat> I was raised in a northern Minnesota town, a resort town. My father was a restaurant tour. So I started working for him when I was about 12 years old, first as a dishwasher and busboy. And by the time I was 14, I was cooking and calling out orders on the line. So from then on, the restaurant bug really bit me. And I've been involved in just multiple aspects of this industry. First for my father and these little moving into the twin cities. I work for a place called Cassetta's right now. It's about a $20 million Italian eatery market wow. uh, style restaurant. I mean, it's just it's just a, a legend in this area. I, how, how many, many units? units? Are good. One. That's one unit. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. that's that's a this, two with six zeros. This gentleman I work for started uh, started with a little Italian market. I think his first year's sales were ninety eight thousand dollars in the first year. This is you know, and, and he's grown this into just amazing business. So I was a general manager for him. Wow. Um, I ran the suite level at Target Center where the Timberwolves play, uh, worked for a couple of uh, very large caterers in the Twin Cities. So my, my career has really kind of, you know, encompassed everything from small restaurants all the way up to very large catering venues. And now you're a CFO, right? And now I'm a CFO of a restaurant group. We are, uh, we are seven restaurants now. Our eighth one is under construction and will be opening this spring. So, you know, that's a whole different topic uh, here, here in pandemic land. We, we decided, yeah, let's, let's go build another restaurant. I, lo I love it. Hey, this, this thing's not lasting forever. I'm on track to get all three vaccines. Uh, so I just, uh, <laughs> what's I, the third I, one? Uh, I don't know any anything, whatever, know. whichever one comes out. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, but I'm I can't wait till the pan pandemic's over. Bruce, I was reading in your book. I, I love that you, you grew up in a seasonal area, which we can kind of relate to in here in Cleveland because when winter hits, it's all indoor dining, and then the patio season is really when life starts to get pumped back into the restaurants and the economy up here. You opened up your own restaurant. Uh, you want to tell the audience a little bit about that? I did. Uh, you know. Um... Oh, about 20 years ago, I got this brilliant idea that uh, I should open my own restaurant. And when I tried to decide where, I thought, well, I remember growing up in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, and it was a, you know, it was a great place to raise children. So 
having two children at that time, I thought, well, I'll just go back home and do this. And uh, researched for a while. I tried to buy some existing restaurants and could not find one that would work. And finally found a piece of property on the public beach that the city of Detroit Lakes had control of. And I made them an offer and was able to get this land. Yeah, I built a place called Portofino Restaurant and World Market back in 1999, I believe we opened it up. I uh, I, I loved your chutzpah in the book, the willingness to go all in. I mean, <laughs> the, 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 so many people like are overwhelmed by, and it, rightfully so, you know, walking into a white box and doing a full build out, but man, you built it from the ground up, which uh, I loved. We did. Yeah. I designed it, found the architect to build it. it. It was my baby. Honestly, I had been in the business about 20 years at that time. And I just thought, yeah, I, I can't lose. You know, I worked for those big places that I just told you about. And, you know, they were very successful. I was their general manager. So I was privy to the owner's information and how we put things together. To me, it was a no brainer until I opened the doors. Yeah. <laughs> and did I, then I learned 20 million? what I didn't know. Yeah, I have a similar experience like that where I went back to my hometown and, and helped a friend open a restaurant. And we ended up being a jazz trio at the county fair, meaning no audience. No one was interested in what we were doing, <laughs> with, right? So it's a humbling experience to say the least. It was it was a year and a half worth of gut punches. But yep. uh, I'll, I'll be honest, and you can probably relate, is it was the best experience I ever had because I had never been introduced to failure before. I had always right. I worked in the cream of the crop restaurants, much that sounds like much like yourself. Yeah. And, uh, I get down there and, and my own hometown served it to me on a silver platter in, in the most uh, despicable of ways. It was gut wrenching. I, I, I would be lying if I didn't say it, it. It took me a little while to overcome failure, especially going back to the hometown. You know, my parents still lived in that town. You know, I knew a lot of people. I had a lot of friends that tried to support me. And when it closed, they were more dumbfounded than I was. Why it didn't. And how long did that venture last, Bruce? It lasted about 13 months. Yeah, I think about 13 months as, as, as long as I made it. I finally hit this point mid, mid July where I literally I had a payroll come up, drained every last dime to cover that payroll. I looked at, you know, I owed vendors, I owed rent, I owed my bank payment. I had uh, utilized every possible friend, family to help me out, and they all had said they're done. So, we made a decision to pull the plug on it, but it was, you know, that particular failure kicked off, you know, what I did for the next 20 years. Do you and think there's one into the book I wrote? Yeah. Do you think there's one, one takeaway, obviously the entrepreneurs and the restaurant people, like they, they take risks all the time. And uh, sometimes what you went through could cause something that somebody's out of the business for good. So, you know, they, they're, they're done with it. So it could put somebody under, you know, but you seem to have come out of it and figured a way, like what was the one thing that caused you to keep moving? You know, the biggest takeaway, what I you know, spent so much time trying to figure out why I failed was understanding that there is not a standard labor cost or food cost that the restaurant industry should hit. You know, I came out of these very successful businesses. I think the the place I came to from before opening this was about a $5 million store. So here I am saying, okay, all I got to do, do is duplicate what they did for labor costs, food costs, alcohol costs, and I'll be successful because this place was successful. Mm -hmm. But if, if you're only doing 2 million, a uh, little something called overhead skews that. So what I really learned is to look at every individual restaurant as a whole and figure out what its overhead is in relation to your sales. Because with that, instead of saying, if I can hit a 30% food cost and a 20% liquor cost, and, I, uh, you know, and I'm going to hope I make money, I can say, okay, we now know what the whole picture looks like. And I'll tell you, this is what you have to hit. If you want to make a profit, you got to do a 28% food cost and you got to hit an 18% liquor or whatever. So it was basically looking at it from a mathematical formula and saying, okay, we know these things. So now instead of saying, let's set this percent and hope we make a profit, I'm just saying we'll reverse it. If you want to make a 10% profit, you have to hit this. Mm -hmm. and yeah, back into that, it. You yeah. can actually price your menu where it needs to be. Yeah. We Bruce, I love that. And we we talk about menu pricing all the time. Do you think that restaurant tours aren't looking at their PL and looking at their prime costs enough? You know, I think they are. But, you know, I've been around these crazy cats for 40 years, restaurant tours driven into their psyche that they have to control costs. So they look at everything. And so, so they say, okay, how, 
if I'm not making money, how can I drop two points in labor? How can I go to my vendors and say, I need another two points here? You know, they start trying to figure out how to cut costs and try to cut themselves into profit. The bottom line is most of us, we create a menu, we create a concept. We need the products and the labor to put that out. We should be looking at what the real cost is of creating that item and then just applying the proper markup to make a profit. I love that point. And, it, and I think I read this in your book, you know, selecting a good vendor uh, doesn't fix a bad business plan. And, you know, we're always trying to save the customer money, save someone money consistently is, is our goal. But right. if they have a bad business plan, there's no amount of savings that I'm going to deliver that's going to fix that problem. Right. Yeah. For instance, is you say you got a, a small independent doing $2 million a year, they're probably buying at 30% food costs, you know, $600,000 of the food. Mm -hmm. You go into them and say, hey, I can save you 5%. Fits that mindset of the restaurateur. Great, I'm saving money. But that 10 or 20 grand, if they're already losing or breaking even, that's still not going to make them happy. You yeah. know, what they really need to understand is, okay, yes, I'm going to buy smart and I'm going to, I'm going to schedule smart. Mm -hmm. But if I want to make my 10% profit, I need to adjust my menu to my model. I got to apply this markup. And the weird thing is most of the mod models I do with this, we're usually talking less than a dollar. You know, the difference of a menu item that breaks even and a menu item that throws off 10% profit is usually a dollar, a dollar 25. So people panic, especially restaurant owners panic and say, well, we can't raise our prices. They think I'm going to come in and say, you know, you got to raise this two or $3. No. It really, we're just like your business. We're a business of pennies. We just yeah. got to cobble enough pennies together to get to our our profit expectations. Yeah, and, and something that we talk to operators a lot about when we're either prospecting or they're looking to make a move to us as a distributor, you know, we could save you 5%, like you said, and let's say that's 15 grand. And the guy's like, okay, that's great. 15 grand, that's amazing. But what we try to talk about before we make a transition is like that 15 grand is great, but if you don't make the appropriate moves on your menu moving forward, you're going to lose that money. Like you don't get that 15 grand every year. Exactly. The, you know what I mean? Like now, now if you're going to move your menu price up with inflation and you're going to make the right moves, you can, you can keep it, but that's mm -hmm. not something that all of a sudden, like you've got it. It's just every year, 15 grand's ringing in. That's not right. how it works. Exactly. It's not <laughs> well, and, and inflation, inflation is working against you. Tyson food is not in the business of making their chicken cheaper. They're going to raise their prices according to, you know, the markets. We have no control over that as, as a broadline distributor. So we want right. the restaurant tour to be successful by doing that and looking at their menu and increasing that. I noticed uh, in your book, one super easy read, great read, but also you really break it down pretty simple as far as step-by-step, step, this is what you need to do and how quickly you can implement this. So someone would pick up your book this weekend and say, all right, I'm in the middle of a pandemic. That's the reality of the situation. What would you say? All right, read my book, but what would you do first out of the book? Well, the tough thing with the pandemic is, uh, it, I'll take our restaurants uh, here in Minnesota. We were ordered shut again. All I can do is take out. Mm -hmm. um, so my sales are 20% of what I would normally would expect. That causes a whole different uh, scenario. So from our perspective, uh, being shut down or forced to take out only, there really isn't a model I can put together that says, oh, great, at 20% of my prior sales, I can still make a 10% profit. So yeah. what we're trying to do now is say, okay, how do we mitigate losses? Mm -hmm. I know that's a little bit different than the question you asked. The, the modeling I put together in my book is, you know, assuming that we have a set of sales expectations of, that we can expect. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different in pandemic, how we want to try to come out of this thing. And the way we look at it is, Take, take you know my restaurants on average. If I just shut the doors, I go dark. I lose about forty to fifty thousand dollars a month. That's you know keeping the utilities on, keeping the the mortgage payments going, keeping you know whatever those minimum expenses is to keep it the thing going. So then I look and say, okay, if I can do twenty thirty thousand dollars a week and take out. You know, I can mitigate that forty to fifty thousand dollar loss down to twenty thousand dollars. So, from my perspective, that's still a win because mm -hmm. if I don't, if I close the doors, I'm I'm losing more money. So, right now, that's the game we're playing when we're in the shutdown. 
And, and I agree with you there. I think, I think it transcends the balance sheet though, also during the pandemic, as far as getting reps for your employees, keeping people yep. employed, and then more yep. importantly, keeping top of mind awareness with the customer mm-hmm. base. So they remember you in the, I think it's just the more you can keep in the game, the less right. likelihood that you're just going to go out. Cause I, this is Dave Ross's comment, but can you imagine what it's like to open up a new restaurant and staff it? Like do that times three or six, like in your case, and then do that with yeah. multiple units. Yeah, we, we shut down a couple during the last time. Our governor had us down for 51 days. And the three restaurants that were shut down, when we went to open them back up again, I mean, we had thousands of dollars in repairs for equipment. Mm-hmm. You know, when you idle equipment like that, they don't all fire up and do what they're supposed to do. Coolers need work. So yeah, It is more advantageous, we think, to struggle to keep everybody employed and going forward and lose a little bit of money than to lose a lot. And plus, this isn't going to last forever. So I think that the operators that can remain open and can remain getting the reps in and and, and serving their customers through carry out as best as possible, like they're, you know, as long as we can make it through, you're going to be a lot stronger on the other side than somebody that's going to try to just shut it down and reopen, you know, it's, it's much easier to keep going than to start over. And I think, I think now is the time to really do a deep dive on resources like Bruce's book, our podcast, talk to your, your broadline distributor rep and really educate yourself because you need to implement these things, whatever the new normal looks like. Again, we're, we're fortunate. We're not completely shut down here. Uh, definitely feeling the effects of the pandemic, but our customers are are moving forward. And it depends what vertical they're in. Some are doing better than others, but all still hurting because of the government's response to this. But at the end of the day, you got to be a student in the game. You got to start cracking a book and br- uh, resources like Bruce's, which are really easy to digest and really easy to implement are something that I would suggest that you, you take a look at. We'll put the link to Bruce's book in, in the show notes but definitely start studying, start thinking of what you're going to do when you get back to 70, 80, 90, hundred percent top line revenue and what that looks like. And then trying to back into some of these numbers. And most importantly, I think you'd agree, Bruce, profit, profit's not exactly. a dirty word. Exactly. Cause the game's going to change. Even if you had a hamburger selling for 13 bucks before the pandemic, mm-hmm. when you reopen, you might have higher labor costs. You might have higher food costs. All this uh, PPE stuff is adding up. I think our chemical and paper supplies are higher than they've ever been. Mm-hmm. So those are all new things that are going to affect the overhead numbers I'm talking about. So you don't get the luxury of saying, ah, I just get to go back to where I was. One thing, the independent restaurant tour is who we love. You do too, I know. But the conundrum of net profit versus cash flow. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, when we start looking at profit and loss statements, we go all the way down to the bottom. In fact, that's where all, every owner I work for always goes right to the bottom first. And <laughs> is there stuff above the bottom? I didn't know. It's, oh yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> oh, you mean all those numbers at the top? It means something. Right, right. Yeah, they just they go they go to the bottom and they work up. But what you know, most people miss, most independents miss, is that bottom line profit may say, okay, you made you know ten thousand dollars this month or twenty thousand dollars this month. It doesn't factor in. Uh, debt service and other other things that would hit a balance sheet versus a profit and loss statement. Most independent restaurateurs are not taught to look at uh, P and L, calculate uh, uh, in EBITDA uh, earnings before interest, tax, amortization, and get that raw number, and then deduct any debt service you have. Another thing I didn't learn when I was doing Portofino twenty years ago was looking at cash flow versus bottom line profit. That bottom line profit, that has deductions for your interest. It has deductions for taxes you pay and and, uh, depreciation. Those are things that help the accountants file your taxes. But that does not necessarily mean that's what your cash flow is. Teaching independents to look at both bottom line profit and then calculating cash flow is huge. Because it's a cash flow that closes the rest. Negative cash flow closes the restaurant, not negative profit. So true. As we wrap up here. What are a few uh, takeaway points that you would suggest that a restaurant tour should be should be doing now as we look into 2021? What all right, this is the things that you're thinking about that you really need to be aware of and be able to to strike on. Well, it's really interesting cuz you know, this pandemic is caused not only fear throughout society but fear throughout restaurant tours and most small business people look at 
you know, when they react to fear, they, they pull back. When I say they pull back, they say, okay, I'm going to stay open, but I really got to limit my hours or I really have to limit my menu choices. Mm -hmm. And there's some bit of reality to that. You can, if, if you were open 24 hours a day, you probably can't be open 24 hours a day now. However, um, I think too many restaurateurs are, are pulling back so far that when we do sit in their restaurant or we do do our pick up our takeout food from them, there is either a lack of choices, a lack of creativity, and more than likely we're spending more money for it. So what I would really recommend to all restaurateurs is to look at the concept that they created. And even though we may need to do different cleaning procedures, maybe we have to put up partitions or whatever it is, don't let the safety aspect take away the magic of your restaurant, what you wanted mm -hmm. to design. Um, don't start pulling uh, menu items because you, you think, uh, well, you know what? I don't want to carry seafood because it's expensive. You know, I went to a restaurant recently and they handed me a menu that had, had I don't know, uh, some type of seafood item and I ordered it and they came back and said, oh, well, it's pandemic. We don't carry that now. Well, I get it. We all understand that these are unusual times, but the customer remembers that. So when we get back to normal, I think the customer is going to gravitate towards that restaurant that they perceived continued to give them that thing they wanted. Yeah. And I think I'm going to steal this from Anthony. Like, I think, you know, the, it's creating friction with the consumer. You know, mm -hmm. we're in a pandemic. People are scared. They're willing to come in and spend money. They're willing to give you their money and you're going to make it difficult to receive their money. <laughs> or you're going to make it challenging or you're going to make a situation yeah. like you went through where, Oh, we don't have the seafood item. Like that's tough, man. Like, you know, and I know it's, it's hard because like the brunt of that responsibility comes down on the restaurant operator, but you gotta, you gotta step it up and say, I'm not going to allow this to happen to my customers. They're willing to come in and give me their money in these times. You know, let's make, yeah, let's would, make it worth their while. I took a friend to a restaurant in Minneapolis uh, this summer and the host station was moved out to the parking lot. We were all spaced out in the parking lot, you know, waiting for uh, our reservation to be called. And then the first thing I got from the host was a five minute dissertation of all the things I can't do. I get it. You know, there are rules we got to follow, but it, by the time I sat down, I thought, well, what do I get to do? I, you know, I know you'll take my credit card, but you know, do I get to do anything else fun tonight? So that's my point is, you know, don't let the pandemic rules steal your vision. Great advice. I think a lot of times we lose sight of that when we're preparing and distracted by everything else, right? Right. So that's crucial. I think that dedication to hospitality and that constant customer experience, whether you're in a pandemic or not, you have to really double down on that and make sure that that customer is, is and to your point, Bruce, the magic. I love that phrase because that's what people are going for. That's what they're going out right. to eat for. Any little thing, whether it's we're out of this alcohol or we're out of the seafood or we're out of this item puts that little note in the back of their mind. Like, Oh, maybe they're not doing so well. Maybe I'm less likely to get a thousand dollars worth of gift cards from this location. So I can give to all my friends for, for the holidays. Those are the sorts of things that you really need to do to make it. And again, make it easy for them to spend money, whether it's having the, uh, the electronic gift cards through their point of sale system or any of those types sorts of things that lets that customer spend money in your restaurant and get a great experience. Oh, exactly. Especially with those gift cards right now, people are afraid to buy them for the holidays because they yeah. want to make sure you're going to be there. Oh, yeah. We're, we're blasting out everywhere that we're remodeling a restaurant and opening a new one, just so everybody gets in their back of their mind. Mm -hmm. You know, these, these guys are in for the long haul. They're not going anywhere. This is a safe buy. That's actually a great point. I, I you know, because there is a lot of gift card promotion, but yeah, if, if, the, if you have a, an air of, uh, you know, like you said, menu items, not there, you know, hours reduced, all those things. Yeah. That, yeah. that would definitely give you some trepidation to wear in the gift card. And the consumer, exactly. the consumer knows that they've seen it before. We've all purchased gift cards and the place goes out of business, you know, two months later, or whatever it is, so you really got to put your best foot forward, give that customer experience and let the community know you're in, you're in it for the long haul and that you're, <clears throat> you're definitely going to be here to stay and delight them into the future.
it seems almost, Bruce, that you're, you're investing in your future by mitigating your losses. It doesn't seem like in anywhere you said you're focusing on profit. It's almost like you've given up on profit. You're mitigating losses. And I look at that as you're 20 grand a month as an investment into your future. And I'm yeah. not sure like the operators you're talking about where they're limiting their menus so much or they're out of fish or they're out of liquor. It seems like those are the ones that are trying to generate a profit right now as opposed to, to mitigating losses and investing in the future. Would you say that's accurate? I would think so, yeah. We were just climbing out of our prior hole. Um, I think I was cash neutral for the last three months before they shut us down again. So, you know, we were just happy. You know, we stopped burning cash. You know, at a, we were running anywhere from 60 to 70% of prior year. It's like, okay, you know, everybody's breathing just a little sigh of relief. So yeah, this, this year, that's a win. There's some greater challenges that some of these independents are going to have to think about with regard to any kind of government money they got. We're still waiting to see how those rules play out. I feel I, like we got, I feel like we all got dished into the world's biggest game of monopoly. Yeah. You know, they threw a bunch of money out there and now we just keep rolling the dice every day and just hope to God we don't land on uh, income tax or boardwalk or, or go to jail. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Bruce. Going to jail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll find me a free parking, fellas. <laughs> Bruce, uh, from everything that I've read, correct me if I'm wrong, you're uh, you got the CFO hat on. Mm -hmm. Those PPP monies are going to be taxable. That's what I just saw recently. Now, the they're going to be in our case 100% forgivable based on the rules Congress mm -hmm. put out, but the IRS is not in sync with this and they're looking at their rules and saying, okay, you, you got a hundred thousand dollars with the PPP that's non revenue generated income. So you cannot for tax purposes, deduct labor, rent, all uh, utilities, vendors from that. So it's going to kind of hang out there. This is going to be really weird. We could, we're probably going to post, you know, a million to a million and a half of losses this year. Mm -hmm. And we could have a tax bill that's even bigger than that based on the PPP stuff. So, you know, yeah. the so, independents and the restaurant tours and the vendors, everybody should be talking to Congress. We got a couple of weeks left here. Try to push them to fix this because Congress intended it to be tax free. The IRS is looking at say our rules don't say that. I encourage all of our listeners to reach out to their congressperson and really mm -hmm push this uh, and let them know that if you have to pay tax on your PPP money, it will yeah. hurt the industry. It'll hurt you. It'll hurt your family. So oh, please, yeah. please make the change. Exactly. And here's the weird thing is if you took idle money as well, even if you have the cash, you can't even distribute it to your owners to pay because that, you know, keeping the idle money precludes you from doing distributions and taking additional loans. So they really put us in a pickle. I don't think they did it on purpose, but the reality is it's there. And, and I really hope Congress fixes it. Well, it, the, the reality is it's fixable by Congress if they would get off their asses and, and actually do something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the holidays are coming. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're, they're, yeah, the recess. They, they do more recess than my son when he was, in, when he was going to school. Is that true? Is that your CFO hat? Yeah. No, this is uh, this is our one and only sponsor, Hillcrest Food Service. There so, you go. All right. <laughs> if you're a, uh, nice if, you're a re if you're if you're a restaurant out there in Northeast Ohio, Columbus, Youngstown, Akron, Canton, and uh, not happy with your current distribution, give us a call. We love local independent restaurant tours. I know Bruce loves local independent restaurants. Uh, we're here for you. Pick up Bruce's book. Uh, Bruce, thanks for coming in today. Uh, I really did enjoy your book. It wasn't just because I was in Jamaica. The book is great. Um, it is it is better in Jamaica. Uh, pro tip, but <laughs> uh, it it was it was it was a great book, and and I really learned a lot from it. But I also uh, I got some extra copies, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give it out to some of my friends because I think it, it's a resource that people can go to. You're getting close to the holidays here, and it's something that you can pick up, read quickly. Uh, but also learn and better your operation because 2021 is around the corner. Now's the time to learn because there's going to be fewer operators out there. There's going to be more people supporting local independent restaurants. The vaccines are coming out. It, it is going to be definitely different and you want to capitalize on that and you got to make up all those losses from 2020. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, when this is all over, maybe we can meet in person. Definitely. No, I, 
I've, I've had 25 meetings this week. We meet in person now. Yeah. I, I, I would, yeah, no, Bruce, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to getting a, a gift of the book from Brian so I can read it as well. Yeah, yeah <laughs> wonderful. I can read stuff as well. <laughs> All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Awesome. Right, thanks. thanks. Take care, bro. These, these two are getting coal. They're, 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 not, they're not getting anything. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks, Bruce. We really appreciate your time. All right. All right. Take care. This high quality pod. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. Take Cut. care. Cut. Adios. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to Restaurantopia. The gratitude that we have for each and every one of you spending your precious time to listen to this podcast is immeasurable. Please make sure to tell a friend about this podcast. And also, if you have any feedback for us, visit us on restaurantopia.com and drop us a line. You can also subscribe on your favorite place to listen to podcasts. Thank you and have a great day.